my Julia Usher recipes for a sweet life. I get so many questions about how to formulate dough so that it behaves well for 3D baking, particularly when making contoured or curvy cookie shapes like this cylindrical piece you see here. This one's got a lot of cracks in it. Most doughs will spread more on curved surfaces and are going to crack and perhaps even fall apart. So this whole video is gonna address how to formulate doughs properly so you get nice crack-free results, unlike this one. We're gonna start first by examining my gingerbread recipe, which I often use in my videos because it performs very, very well with a few adjustments. We'll start first in addressing four recipe-related variables that I sometimes tweak in it or don't tweak to make it perform better. And those will include the flour to fat ratio, the amount of leavening, i.e. the amount of baking soda or baking powder in the recipe, the type of fat that's used, be it shortening or butter, they have different melting points and that can impact the spreading, and also the use of egg or no use of egg in a recipe. I'll also explore two process-related variables, and by that I mean things not integral to the recipe, but things you do in shaping the dough that can have an impact on spread or in handling the dough. So I'll be looking at two, as I said, and they will be the thickness to which the dough is rolled, and also whether the dough is actually chilled again before baking after you handle and roll it. Once I've explored how those variables impact my gingerbread dough, we're gonna then go to my sugar cookie recipe, which I hadn't to this point formulated for 3D baking, and apply some of the lessons learned to get it to perform well on contoured surfaces. As it's formulated, as is and stated in my cookbooks, it doesn't do so well on curvy shapes, particularly really curvy ones like this. The more curved it is, the more spread you're gonna get. But I think by the end of this video, you'll come away with some lessons that show you which variables most impact the spreading. And then hopefully, the goal is not necessarily to provide you with a, an explicit formula you can take home with you, but hopefully those lessons can be applied to help you in reformulating your own dough for 3D baking. Of course, you can use my recipes reformulate it as well, but it's, it's really important to understand the technique and the underlying variables in order to really move forward and adapt your own recipes. So I'm going to start first by describing my gingerbread dough recipe, the key ingredients in it that relate to those four recipe related variables. I'm going to show you how I shape it over a cylinder, and then we're going to compare a lots of different recipe tweaks to it by looking both at curved cylinders, how they bake up, and flat cookies. You'll see in all cases that the flat cookie will crack less and spread less, and that's an important lesson. So we'll be primarily focused on how do these curved cookies perform with each recipe or process tweak we make. Okay, so here's my gingerbread recipe. This is my cutout cookie gingerbread recipe as written in my books and on my website exactly as formulated there. Straight out of the fridge, it's a nice soft dough. You can roll it instantly. You can also roll it instantly even without refrigerating it. I do refrigerate it so that the spices kind of meld into the dough and it's got a beautiful flavor that way. But refrigeration is not necessary. It's this texture more or less refrigerated or unrefrigerated. But here we're gonna concentrate on the four recipe variables that most impact spreading in my opinion. First, the flour to fat ratio in this recipe is about 3.4 flour to fat by weight. So the more flour, typically, the less a dough will spread. So that's got that going for it. That's a relatively high flour to fat ratio compared to my sugar cookie recipe, which we'll talk about later. The next variable is the amount of leavening. It's got one and a half teaspoons of baking soda in it, and we'll look at the impact of cutting that in half and what that does to spread. The fat in it is all shortening, no butter. Shortening has a higher melting point than butter, so my theory would be that this dough would actually spread less than an all-butter-based dough. So we'll be looking at that tweak. We'll be substituting all butter for all of the shortening and see what that does. And then this recipe does have an egg in it. Unlike shortbreads and things like that that don't have egg in them, it does have one egg, and I think that adds to the resiliency and flexibility of the dough. So I, I do think that's critical for 3D baking. We'll see what happens if I take an egg out. In some cases, I will be 
moving variables in directions I wouldn't normally go. I'll be moving them in directions that I think are going to increase spread because this dough starts out pretty well formulated for 3D baking, but those are useful lessons to see too. So the first thing I want to do is actually show you the pieces that I'm going to be using as the control. I mentioned the cylinder and also a two and a half inch round. But in all cases, my control pieces will be rolled to 3 16ths of an inch thick. Later on, we'll be looking at process variables and rolling the dough to 1 8 of an inch, and we'll see what impact that has on cracking and spreading. So in the control, it's rolled a little bit thinner than a lot of you roll your cookie dough to start, 3 16ths of an inch. In all cases, I'm rolling the dough. It'll be a first roll on the dough with a little light flouring of the surface. The flour, the addition of flour will cause the dough to spread less. So I don't want to be comparing a first roll of dough to a second roll of dough because I will have some added flour in the second roll, which might create a different effect. So in the control, again, everything will be rolled freshly mixed, not rolled once before or twice before. And then the other factor to recognize is that all dough will be chilled, well chilled, at least three or four hours before rolling the dough, but I'm not going to re-chill it or refreeze it before putting it in the oven. With that being said, that explains what everything else we're going to do today is compared to, and I'm just going to shape the cylinder because that's kind of a unique thing. I chose the cylinder for this experiment because it's so darn curvy. This is going to really exaggerate the spread. So if you formulate your dough to behave well on what I think is about a two and three quarter inch diameter cylinder, it's probably going to behave well on a lot more gently curved shapes, much better actually on more gently curved shapes. You all know how to cut out a two and a half inch round, so we're not going to do that. I'm just going to lightly dust the surface and roll it to 3 16 of an inch thick. I gauged the 3 16 inch roll exactly on each of these tests by using a rolling pin with rolling guides. In all cases, I used the same template, so I started with the dough the exact same size going on to the cylinder as well. I tried to control as many variables as possible, so this would be as scientific as baking can be. And I'm using just enough flour so I'm able to lift this off without it misshaping too much. So we get a pretty true shape going onto the cylinder. And lay it on the cylinder, wrap it around. It goes almost halfway around. So the other thing I controlled for is making sure before it went in the oven that it was centered on that cylinder. It wasn't tilted one direction or the other because the direction it tilts is the direction it's likely to fall off the cylinder more. So I just want to make sure everything's centered and given a fair shot, equal shot going into the oven. And then all pieces baked at 375 degrees Fahrenheit, which is my normal baking temperature. I baked the rounds because they're smaller, about eight minutes, and all the cylinders about 10 minutes. Now we want to move on and talk about the impact of the first recipe related variable, which is the amount of flour in the dough. Because this dough already has a lot of flour in it at that 3.4 ratio, I actually looked at the impact of reducing the flour in the dough. Again, going in the reverse direction, but I thought that if I can reduce the flour and still get an equivalent amount of cracking, then I might have a positive textural impact on the dough that might be acceptable even so. But before we head that direction, let me just show you how this dough, the control, bakes up on the curved surface. Quite a bit of cracking at a 3 16 of an inch thickness through here. Meanwhile, the two and a half inch round looks perfect. And it spread just a hair, maybe a sixteenth or an eighth of an inch from the original cutter size. So this just demonstrates the point that any amount of spread of a cookie dough is going to be exacerbated once you get it on a curved surface. And that's why this video is so important to understand how to formulate the dough to avoid that. So looking at the flour to fat ratio, the control pieces here are always on the bottom. Control cylinder, control round. And that will be the case throughout the rest of the video. Up here I've got my 20% reduction in flour. And again, I was thinking, can I get away with a little less flour in the recipe and improve the texture, but not impact the cracking much? And the results on the 2D cookies, well, there's more spread. You can see it and you can definitely see it relative to the cutter if I center it on there maybe spreads another sixteenth of an inch, but it's not very cracked on the surface, but you see really dramatically different results when we get to the 3D 
curve shapes, as I mentioned before, this is 20% less flour and completely unacceptable. So this is obviously not a direction I can go with this recipe. The 3.4 flour to fat ratio is probably where I want to stay put. I'm now going to explore the effect of substituting a different fat. Again, mine is all shortening based. My theory is by substituting all butter, it's going to take me in a direction I don't want to go because butter has a lower melting point, but let's check that out. So up at the top, I have disastrous consequences with all butter. This is an all butter substitution by weight, not by volume, by the way. That's the most accurate way to do these kinds of experiments. So on the cylinder, it slid off almost completely. Well, completely, right? And cracked into pieces. And I got substantially more, or somewhat more, I should say, spread on the 2D cookie, but not nearly as, as devastating. So substituting butter for shortening is not the way I probably want to go either. From a flavor standpoint, I actually like the shortening in this dough better than butter because I can definitely taste the butter in the butter-based dough. It almost interferes with the spices. In the shortening-based dough, the spices really come forward. And so in that sense, I like the shortening too. I will point out that I had a very different result when I took this dough and then froze it for 10 minutes after rolling it and baking it, it ended up performing much closer to my control. And that's probably because the fat solidified to a certain extent and just wasn't able to spread as much once it hit the heat of the oven. So you can get very different results depending on whether you freeze it after shaping. But again, probably not a direction I wanna go for both flavor reasons and this unpredictable nature of it. So we're gonna move on now to the amount of leavening in the dough. So naturally reducing the amount of leavening would cause the dough to rise less and probably spread less. And that's exactly the result you see here. Up here I have half the amount of leavening. So instead of the one and a half teaspoons in the recipe, I've cut it to three quarters of a teaspoon. Significantly less cracking on the surface. So that's one way to go. The only caution I have is that reducing the leavening makes kind of a tougher chewy dough. So one thing I wanna look at going forward is some of those process related variables to see if I can get a similar effect by either rolling the dough thinner or by chilling it without altering the texture or density of the dough. The cookies, naturally the 2D ones, this one didn't spread appreciably at all. This one again spread about a 16th of an inch. And just as a reminder, these are all rolled to the same thickness, 3 16 of an inch thick to start. So this is a possible solution, though it will impact the density and quality of the dough as you taste it. Let's move on to the last recipe related variable I want to talk about, is, which is whether there's egg in the recipe or not. So we've got the no egg to the egg comparison, the one egg in my control, the no egg in this recipe. And for all intents and purposes, they look pretty identical once baked. Obviously taking egg out isn't any, gonna lend any, any benefit from a cracking standpoint. I will say, however, the dough handling properties before they were baked were substantially different in the no egg dough. It was much more crumbly. It was harder to wrap around the contoured shape without the dough itself cracking even before baking. So a lot of reasons to have egg in the dough. It again, lends some resiliency and flexibility to the dough. Let's turn now to the process related variables, talking first about the effect of chilling the dough after you've rolled it. So onto the chilling or freezing comparison. My control again here. In this scenario up top, I actually froze the dough for 15 minutes after I rolled it. It had been previously chilled for three to four hours, then rolled, then shaped and frozen for 15 minutes and not a material difference between the 2D cookies. I would say there's definitely some improvement in the surface here. There's still some large cracks like here, but a lot of them have disappeared. So freezing the dough can help. I have had variable success with this particular test, however, because I do these tests multiple times. And in other cases, several other cases, I saw a similar level of cracking. So my guess is that this dough is a little unpredictable. It's shortening based, remember, and shortening doesn't respond to chilling the same way that butter does. It doesn't really set the fat. 
So that might be, you know, one reason I got some of those unpredictable results. Let's move on to the last process variable, which is rolling the dough thinner. Again, this dough was rolled to 3 16ths of an inch thick and everything we've looked at so far has been rolled to that same thickness. So in this final test of process related variables, I rolled the dough 1 8 of an inch thick in this scenario up top, but it produced dramatically better results just by rolling it a little bit thinner. It's virtually crack free except for a few fine fissures up here which would easily be covered with almost any kind of decorating treatment. Likewise, the 2D cookies spread not at all or hardly at all as compared to a little bit more on the control piece. So my conclusion with my gingerbread recipe is I'd much prefer to just roll it a little bit thinner than tweak any other recipe variable. I don't really want to cut the leavening in half because that'll toughen the dough. This way I'll get a similar texture to the dough but the benefit of no cracking. I want to pause here and talk about four other process related variables I often use to control misshaping as well as spreading of the dough in all of my baking practice. So about those four process variables that I do under any circumstances, whether they be 2D or 3D, I like to roll on silicone mats and cut on them too. And then I can pick up the entire mat and directly shift it onto the baking sheet, the backside, and slide it into the oven. That minimizes any misshaping of the dough that might occur in transferring the cut dough from another surface onto the baking sheet. Often it can misshape, particularly if the dough isn't chilled. So I do that. I tend to prefer to work with silicone mats as opposed to parchment because sometimes parchment can buckle in the heat of the oven and misshape particularly delicate and fragile cookie pieces. When I'm doing a 3D project and the cookies are going to be viewed from the side, I often work with a rolling pin with guides or with dough guides that you put on side of the dough. That ensures just a uniform roll across the entire piece so I get a nice cross section that is completely even. I tend to wing it when I'm not doing a 3D construction where that's the case, but these tools are nice ones to have in your repertoire because they'll also ensure more even baking of the cookie if it's a uniform thickness across. And then the last process variable I control relates to the mixing of the dough. I minimize the creaming of the fat, either the butter or the shortening and the sugar. Uh, with a cake, you cream that quite a while, multiple minutes, often to incorporate air and to make a nice, even, fluffy texture to the cake. But with cookies, I don't do that because it incorporates more air and causes the dough when it bakes to mound and crest a little bit more. And typically, I like a flat surface. It facilitates even flooding and decorating, and also with 3D construction, makes putting those pieces together a lot more seamless. So let's move on now to my sugar cookie dough and talk about how it exists as it's written in my books and on my website. As I mentioned before, it spreads quite a lot. It's got a lot lower flour to fat ratio than my gingerbread and that's why. So we're going to see what lessons we learned from the gingerbread exercise and determine whether they can be applied to my sugar cookie recipe. For instance, I want to know if I can just roll it thinner and have a great result. We'll see. So let's talk about my sugar cookie recipe as it's formulated across those four recipe variables. It's only got a 1.75, 1.8 flour to fat ratio by weight, so it's inherently a much softer dough to begin with. It does have some butter in it, roughly an even mix by weight of butter and shortening, so it responds a little bit better to chilling. It'll be a firmer dough if it's been in the fridge for any period of time, so I most always roll this in advance, not to meld the flavors per se, but to make it easier to handle and roll. Unlike the gingerbread recipe, as I mentioned, where I can roll it straight away without any chilling because it's got so much flour in it. So let's talk about the leavening in this recipe. It's got one and a half teaspoons of baking powder to two cups of flour. Whereas recall, my gingerbread had one and a half teaspoons of baking soda to five cups of flour. So if you look at the leavening agent to flour ratio, it might seem like this one's going to be a lot more potent because it's got a higher ratio of baking powder to flour. But as it turns out, baking soda is about four times more potent as a leavening agent than baking powder. 
So when you net all that out, this dough has the equivalent of about one teaspoon of baking soda to five cups of flour as compared to the one and a half teaspoons of baking soda to five cups of flour in the gingerbread. So it actually has less leavening power in it. So while it has some butter in it that's likely to cause it to spread more, it's got a little less leavening power to it, which might cause it to spread less than my gingerbread recipe. And we'll see if that's the case. Do those two variables counteract each other? It also calls for one egg, as does the gingerbread recipe. So they're equivalent in that respect, except it's one egg to a lot less flour in this recipe than in the gingerbread recipe. So that also contributes a little bit of moisture and softness to the dough. So that's the basic recipe unformulated for 3D baking. And you can see how it compares to my gingerbread control, really spreads quite a lot and almost disintegrates. Again, this was rolled to 3 16ths of an inch thickness, and if you zoom in close, especially on this side, you can see that it spreads so much, it's almost spread to about an eighth of an inch in thickness, and it completely fell off the ring. So obviously, that lower flour to fat ratio has a big impact on the dough, and we're, we may have to do something about that. On the 2D cookies, they spread about the same amount, maybe this one a little bit more. So again, the results are much more dramatic, spreading and cracking on a curved surface. So for my first test, I wanted to look at a process related variable, that being how thinly or thickly I roll the dough, because as you recall from the gingerbread, all I had to do was roll it to 1 8 of an inch thick and it performed beautifully. So I'm hoping I can shortcut this whole process and just roll this dough a little bit thinner and have a great result for 3D baking. But let's see. Here's the dough up top rolled to 1 8 of an inch thick. And here's my control again at the bottom. And it did do much better. I mean, it clearly didn't fall off the cylinder. However, on this side, you'll see a lot of stretched areas and open areas that make this piece really delicate and fragile. So while it helped, I think I can do better by possibly addressing either the other process related variable of, of chilling it beforehand, because there is butter in that dough, so that might be more impactful here, or looking at some of the recipe related variables. I wanna turn next to the leavening in the dough because if I can just tweak the leavening a bit as opposed to adding a lot of flour to this dough, I'm gonna alter the texture a lot less. And I wanna always constantly balance the texture to the spread. And we don't wanna create a dough that's so darn tough but performs beautifully for 3D decorating, but then you can't eat it. So again, if I were to tweak one of those recipe variables, I'd start first with the leavening and then start adding more flour, but we'll see if that's enough. I'm back to rolling the dough 3 16 of an inch thick, but I've reduced the leavening in half so that one and a half teaspoons of baking powder went down to three quarters of a teaspoon. And it performed less well than rolling the dough thinner and certainly not well enough for 3D baking. A lot more separation and some ripping of the dough apart at the bottom that actually slid off the cylinder. So just reducing the leavening alone isn't enough. I also did a test where I reduced the leavening and rolled it thinner, and I got a result very similar to just rolling it thinner. So I want to now move on to tweaking the flour because clearly this has such a low flour to fat ratio that it's gonna spread if I don't mess with that at all. So we're gonna increase that. I'm gonna look at first increasing at 20% to about a 2.0 flour to fat ratio. I'm gonna increase it gradually, because again, the less I can toughen the dough and stiffen it, the better it will be texturally. And we'll see if that's enough to make a difference. Okay, so we've established that rolling it thin all by itself wasn't enough. Cutting the leavening in half wasn't enough. It's still a really fragile dough. So I thought, okay, let's increase the flour. This is a 20% increase in flour to a flour to fat ratio of about 2.0 by weight versus the original 1.8. And let's, before we compare those, look at the actual doughs themselves. These two doughs have been out of the fridge the same amount of time. Again, this is the control dough, and this is the one with 20% more flour. And this is super soft. This one, is a lot more stiff and yet still pliable and it made a great rolling dough. So that's a plus. It, was, it didn't get so stiff and difficult to handle that I couldn't use it and shape it around a cylinder. 
Now, let's go back and look at the results. It performed a lot better, but still substantial cracking. Again, these two are both rolled as 3 16 of an inch thick. Still a, a little bit too much cracking for what I want to do. In fact, a lot. This looks more like my gingerbread control recipe looked like to start. So the next thing I wanted to look at was increasing the flour to fat ratio even more, like matching the flour to fat ratio in the gingerbread, and maybe that would do it. And I ran that test, but when I mixed the dough to that flour to fat ratio, it was impossible to handle, it literally crumbled apart. So just matching another magical flour to fat ratio in another recipe isn't gonna be enough. You've gotta take into consideration all the other ingredients in the recipe. Remember, my gingerbread recipe has a lot more liquid in it. It's got a lot of molasses, whereas this one doesn't. So just increasing the ratio ended up with this you know, unmanageable result. So my next step, having done all of that, was to say, okay, this is a pretty good flour to fat ratio. I also tasted it, and texturally it was pretty good. So what happens if I roll it thinner and just leave the flour to fat ratio at 20%? And that's the last test I did. And here's my last test of the day, which will tell you in advance that I'm on the right course. This is a 20% reduction in flour by weight to the 2.0 ratio, but I rolled it 1 8 of an inch thick to start, and it, it didn't spread, so it maintained its thickness. In fact, it looks a little bit thicker than when I initially rolled it. It's virtually crack-free, and you know here's where we started. So my conclusion with my sugar cookie recipe was to roll it thinner, just as I did with my gingerbread dough, but I additionally needed to add some flour to give it a little more stiffness and stability. Again, added the flour gradually so as not to toughen the dough. Which brings me to my conclusions. Let me just recap a few things. Again, I'm not here to give you ratios and formulas per se. I'm hoping you take away the lessons learned, and they are, if you're trying to formulate a different dough for 3D baking, I'd start first, based on what we learned here today, with just rolling it thinner than you normally would, say it about 1 8 of an inch thick. Test it on a cylinder. If it doesn't crack, leave it there because you won't have altered the taste or texture of the dough at all. Then I'd suggest, if that doesn't work, decreasing the leavening because that's less likely to have a disastrous textural effect on the dough as would be increasing the flour wholesale. And recall that experiment I did by matching the flour to fat ratio with this recipe to the one in the gingerbread. It just fell apart. We don't want that. If reducing the leavening and rolling it thinly isn't enough, then try, as I had to here, increasing the flour, but do so ever so gradually not to compromise taste and texture. Also note those detailed graphics you saw floating overhead. I have them all in a PDF. You can find the link to that PDF in the video description underneath the video player. So check it out. Till next video, live sweetly and happy 3D baking. Mm -hmm.